So we're here in the book of Leviticus. It is an exciting time for us. There's so much strange stuff ahead of you and of me. And we're going to see how we get on. And I've asked you a few minutes ago what you know about Leviticus. And some of you have focused on law, on sacrifices, offerings, uh, and so on. And you've told me that Leviticus has 27 chapters. We've reminded ourselves of that. And even that you shall not lie with your brother's wife or uncover her nakedness. Um, and just to top it off, uh, you might want to know, uh, in case you're wondering this evening, can a Levite, a descendant of Levi, be a descendant of Aaron, uh, be a priest if his testicle is crushed? The answer is no. So if that was your question this evening, uh, consider it answered. Okay, there we are. Some people come to the book of Leviticus and normally what tends to happen, I have experienced this at the beginning of my uh, Christian walk, is you do the Bible in a year plan, Genesis, Exodus, you die. It's over. Okay, Leviticus, there is no way you're going to put up with that. But let's talk about this book for a little bit because it's about much, much more than a daily barbecue um, at the Lord's house, at the tabernacle at this point. Why does it even exist? Well, the name is apparently a Latinized uh, name that means of the Levites, matters concerning the Levites, those who are responsible for introducing uh, people to the worship of God, the people who would have, uh, behold, manned the tabernacle. And we'll talk about the tabernacle. Here is one of our young people's interpretation. Huh? Fantastic, yeah? That's really good, isn't it? Um, and apparently, one of our elders just happens to own a tabernacle in his loft. Okay? How long has it been there? I'll, 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 le I'll let you decide. Okay, but there we are. So we're going to be talking about this place where you come to maintain your relationship with the Lord. So matters concerning the Levites, probably about 15th uh, century BC, written by Moses, and in a really strange structure that seems to, however, depends on who you read, uh, but peaks at Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, saying that in the whole of the book, the most important thing is the Day of Atonement, the forgiveness of sins that points to the cross of Jesus. Yet, I would be able to tell you, this is quite a joyful book. Why is verse 1 really joyful? The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said. Why is that a joyful thing? Well, think about it. Who is Moses? History of Israel. All right. Big gun. Big dude. Really, really awesome dude. If you remember from the very beginning in the book of Genesis, we were in the garden. It was fantastic. Okay, Adam and Eve are there. God is available. Metaphor of God walking in the garden. Then separation from God. Because they disobey him, they go their own way. Um, they sin, they damage their relationship with God forever. And they have to be uh, kicked out of the garden for that reason. God continues to speak. He continues to pursue his people. And so he speaks to, uh, you know, people at different times and reveals himself to them. You can think of patriarchs, you can think of uh, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph in, in Egypt. God's people end up in Egypt. We get to the book of Exodus and they're in a difficult situation. They're enslaved and they need God to come and rescue them. There he is. Mm, I love that. I love that. That's so good. I have to have some biceps to do that pose there. Um, but if you're old enough, you might even know what movie that's from. But there we go. Moses, then, the writer of this book, is smack dab in the middle of this situation where God frees his people from Egypt, and we've got that happening. From the beginning of Exodus up until chapter 15, God rescues them. They wander around in the desert. They repent to God. They trust him, and they say, from chapters 20 to 22, they're given the law how to love God who has rescued them. And they say in chapter 24, we will make a covenant with you, God. Well, he says that to them, and they say, we promise we will do everything it says in the law. So they have a covenant. They swear allegiance to God that he will be their king. Why is it then, in such an exciting context, that Leviticus is the most murderous book of Bible in a year plans? I think it's because we struggle to read it in its context, we struggle to read why, uh, just at the end of Exodus, it would be so exciting that the Lord would speak from here, from the tent of meeting. 
Why is it that it makes a difference that the king lives among you? Ooh. Look at Exodus 19 with me for a second. I don't remember whether I put it on there or not. Listen to it. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. What difference does it make if you have a king? Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. You are mine. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Themes in this book of Leviticus. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites, God says to Moses. So for Israel to belong to God, that's what it means for them to have him as king. For them to be his royal priests, a light to the nations, introducing nations to God, happening at this place. But how are they going to do that? If after Sinai, everyone is afraid, because if they go and touch the mountain while Mo Moses is meeting with God, they die. Even if animals touch it, they die. How is it that they're going to enjoy this relationship that I'm speaking to you about? Well, they must learn to live as subjects of the king. That's what the entire book is going to be about. How do you live with God as your king and with your king among you, living right in the middle? You can't take Sinai with you, but God says, I will give you a tabernacle, a place where I'm going to make my presence known in a special way, and I'm going to teach you how to come to me, how to approach me, so that you can enjoy a relationship with me. Turn over the page, Exodus, Exodus 40, last chapter. Verse 35. Throughout several chapters in Exodus, God had been explaining to Moses, for you to be able to approach me, I'm going to teach you how, build this place to my specifications, and I will come and symbolically inhabit it. Verse 34 of Exodus 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, because, in the verse before, so Moses finished the work. The cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting, because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. What a moment of tension. God says, you can approach me. You can have your sins forgiven. It's all going to happen. And all of a sudden, you can't even go in. Thus, the need for Leviticus. They're in a covenant with their king. And we're going to learn what this covenant entails. What's it all about? Why is it giving them laws and promises? Because that's what goes with a treaty with a king. There are obligations, there are duties. In Eden, if you break the covenant with God, you are pushed out, you are kicked out. Here at the tabernacle, it leads to God's people being punished if they commit treason against their king. Much like becoming perhaps the citizen of a country. I know that there are, you know, privileges and obligations if I get to become a citizen I just sent my application for indefinite leave to remain, by the way, yesterday, so uh, pray for me. Um, and those of you who would like to send letters to the Home Office criticizing me, please don't. But there are privileges, there are duties, uh, as well as the privileges. For example, I remember my teachers talking to me in school that whatever I did, do they say this in this country? Whatever I did outside of school while wearing the uniform was misrepresenting the school. Do you still say that? Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? See, we've got some teachers in the room saying, yes, we do. And I actually know of friends that were punished for something they did outside of school, at school, because they misrepresented the school. There are duties. You're part of a family. Privileges, they put food on the table, a roof over your head, but there are duties. You've got to fill, fill the dishwasher up. You've got to do uh, some other things. And if you don't, your pocket money goes away, if you ever had it in the first place. If you have a covenant with a king, there are privileges. His covenant love protection, his forgiveness, his surrounding, no one can attack you. And yet, there are duties as well. What happens if you break covenant loyalty in a serious way? We'll see that, and you can glance at it in chapter 10. I'm not going to read from it, but you can just have a glance at it. What happens if you betray your country? Well, you might know that, because you might know who this bloke is. Edward Snowden leaked uh, international secrets. The U.S. was not very happy with him, so much so he fled to Russia, and he can't leave. Because just on three charges, he would already get 30 years in the U.S. if he set foot there. Treason 
is a serious thing against the king. To betray your country, even if you are underage, this country has decided that Shamima Begum will be stripped of her citizenship. She can't go back. Even today, an act considered to be treason, I'm not going to comment on whether that's right or not, but just on the fact that even today we understand that betraying your country can have serious consequences. Should you be surprised that the king of all kings also has harsh penalties for treason, even when it comes to God's own country? I don't mean Yorkshire. But we're going to learn just two quick things, okay, in this part one. This king is holy. The king that is among you here in Leviticus, who lives in this tabernacle symbolically, in the middle of the Israelite camp, he says, I am holy. I am set apart. I'm completely other. And if you follow me, so will you be. I'm not like the gods of the other nations. And he shows them, even in the way that he designs the tabernacle. God lives in the middle of the camp. He's set apart. And everything in here, I mean, whether you're talking about, where's my, oh, everything is like crammed in here. It's fantastic. Okay. Um, each of the elements, oh, my, um, my table of showbread just got a little bit uh, stuck there. Okay. But each one of these elements, there we are. Look at that. Oh, that's colorful, beautiful, isn't it? Fantastic. There we go. Aren't you glad we bought these cameras? Um, each of these elements and the curtain that separates different parts, uh, the holy place from the most holy place. This is really great because I can take the lid um, off here, whereas over here, even to the degree of the people who can come here and make an offering, already tells you that the presence of God is dangerous and yet accessible at the same time. Can't just come in and touch the altar. Can't just come in and touch the wash basins where uh, the priests uh, do their necessary uh, washing. You can't just unannounced, uninvited, come and sacrifice your animal in, at the north side of the altar. You most certainly cannot go into the holy place um, for a laugh. You cannot go into the most holy place if you are not the high priest, and even then once a year. What would happen if you approached the king uninvited? Well, you remember the book of Esther. She is afraid, because even in a pagan nation, if the king does not extend his scepter to me, I will die. He may kill me. This king shows in chapter 10 to Nadab and Abihu, that if you take it lightly and you just think, just because you do it every day and you're a priest and you come into his presence, you will be punished for treason and the penalty is death. That already inspires an awe of God. He is, he is holy, set apart, he is greater, he is other. And that means that Leviticus tells us there is a proper way to approach God. Even now, there is a proper way to approach God. God. And yeah, I said to you earlier, didn't I, that Leviticus is a joyful book. I mean, so far we're talking about being punished for treason and death and it's the king and it's like, oh my goodness. And yeah, it's, it's a joyful book. Let me tell you at least one reason. Do you see the number of offerings on here between here and chapter 5, which is the section explaining to the worshiper what they need to do? You've got from chapter 6 verse 8 onwards uh, uh, a little more information for the priests themselves as well. But it's interesting, three of these are voluntary offerings, including the burnt offering that we're talking about tonight. If they're voluntary, why would someone do this? It's a very costly thing to do. They would only do it because they do it joyfully to the Lord if they don't have to do it. And so the king is holy, and we see his holiness in his character. Because the way that someone writes policies, laws, shows us something about their character. Doesn't it? Isn't that why perhaps you might know this lady uh, in this slide? You might know that she's known in a specific way. So we'll go, we'll go back to the slide. Um, 
I'm like keeping the AV people on their toes, it's amazing. We've got like all sorts of cameras going on here. What was she known as? Oh, really? That too. Okay, interesting. Um, but some people have said it here as well. The Iron Lady. Apparently, she was, she was tough, okay? Uh, that is interesting, especially um, here in Chesterfield, uh, saying that um, to, you know, perhaps some descendants from miners. You may not like her very much. But her character was shown, for good or for ill, in the policies that she made. Her character was shown. Even the British Bulldog was known uh, for certain, you know, blasé comments, but also tough leadership. That's, I think, why, because our character is revealed in the way that we uh, pursue rules or set rules. That's why you know when, for example, Bossy Lucy becomes, there's nobody else called Lucy here this evening, okay? Bossy Lucy in your group at school, when she gets, you know, to be head girl, prefect, head of your group, that's why you really get to know her, okay? That's why when the same thing happens to Dominic, you really get to know him because they might turn out to become, you know, the Kraken, just a horrible, like whipping people because their character just comes out. And as we see in this introduction in the book of Leviticus, even the laws that are crazy, like the crushed testicle I told you about, reveal something of God's character that inspires awe and worship in us. And I know I'm kind of making you salivate after these things without telling you exactly what they mean. Like, why not wear two types of fabric in the same piece of clothing? Well, we'll get to that um, at some point. And so Leviticus teaches us, this is how you live in my kingdom. And God shows his character, his holiness, through the laws that he gives. Laws like, if you drop grain when you're harvesting, leave it for the poor. It shows his caring nature towards the poor. Laws like this. Did you know that, oh, I didn't put a, did you know that the majestic God put this verse in Leviticus? Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 18. First quote of love your neighbor as yourself in the Old Testament. That might be a surprise to you. Hopefully that excites you. And as any king, this king has his servants. His servants are uniformed, and they are the priests. Uniformed servants serving before the king. Just as any other king, this king is majestic. We can see that, can't we? We can see that this king is majestic because he's actually got a palace. Sorry, I'm like keeping you guys on your toes, going back onto different scenes. I'm like disappearing and coming over here. You know what I mean? Um, but over here, if you come over here to the tabernacle again, this king is super majestic. From the most holy place, we go from gold, pure gold. And as we branch out, we go to silver, precious wood, acacia wood. So that when you look at this place, you see a palace. And there are other quotes in the scriptures that will uh, talk, for example, about how uh, over here, the Ark of the Covenant, have we got there? Um, the Ark of the Covenant, God's royal throne, his footstool. Forget the verse in two Chronicles. I don't know if I wrote it down here. Yeah, God's footstool, 1 Chronicles 28, 2, guarded by cherubim as soldiers atop the Ark. Uh, referenced in 2 Samuel 6, 2. How awesome this king in his awesome palace, in his throne room. Yet, keep that again, hand in hand with, this book is joyful. This book is joyful. Even the weird stuff is joyful. Even the weird stuff is joyful. If we were in ancient Israel, I'd say to you ladies, Please, if you're in your period, can you just make sure you mark your seat so that no one will be unclean by sitting on the same seat that you're in tonight? Even that, when we get to it, is joyful. I know you're thinking it's bonkers, bonkers, right? But by the end of our series in Leviticus, you will see, in every way, the book points to Jesus, to his sacrifice, to his calling for discipleship, Let's pray together. 
Father, thank you for today, for being able to get together to praise you and to revel in your love. Sorry, Caroline, we're going we're gonna to cut that bit out. <laughs> it's, man, you, just get, you, you guys need to have a look sometime at how many buttons there are just in that program that we have to use every week. I just wanted to let you know. But we're going to see that this book points to Jesus. My first 20 minutes are up. I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to just uh, hopefully pray and encourage you. He is the Holy King in your midst. He is holy. He is majestic. And as you read this, and as you look at the tabernacle, gold, silver, acacia wood, precious, death penalty, treason, a covenant of love and protection. As I pray, let God increase your awe of him. So we have much to say. And I'm, I'm going to speak at you like a machine gun, okay? We're going to see how we get on. We uh, left off with everything in this book points to Jesus. Very obviously that Jesus is our burnt offering, and we're going to get to that. But first, we need to spend some time talking about the tabernacle and what worshippers of God would do, because that will give you a deeper appreciation for the freedom that if you're a Christian today, that you have in the presence of God. I'm not averse to Disney, but, you know, I have to say that I have one thing against it, and it's what talking animals have done for me as a person, okay? I like to think very deeply about things, and I have noticed that those of you who um, have cared for animals, but also have had animals that you ate and that you slaughtered or sent to be slaughtered, for example you don't tend to name the animals that you're going to slaughter, right? You don't say, tomorrow we shall eat, you know, kitsy or whatever. You can call a pig kitsy. I don't know what you do. But I know that my grandparents in the farm, they were not naming the carneiros, the sheep, uh, that they were going to slaughter when the, when the family got together. It's just not a thing, unfortunately, because we used to see talking animals everywhere. It compounds this sense of, you read Leviticus 1, this is barbaric. This is evil. And yet for most of the history of the world, that was okay. For most of the history of the world, we knew that there was a connection between those two pictures. We knew that. You know, I saw one of uh, my grandmother's uh, household slaughter a chicken. Slit its throat, upside down, bleed it out, hold it over the boiling pot of water, let the pores open, feather it, put it on the counter, gut it, all that stuff. That was normal. And so when you have that feeling of outrage, try and love diversity and put yourself in the shoes of people who lived at a time where that is normal. For those who believe in the God of the Bible, as well as those who didn't. And so we begin to ask the question, how do you serve this king? Because the biggest reason why these offerings seem barbaric to us is because we don't think sin is serious enough to be punished. And so we want to ask three quick questions. And that's kind of the format that we're going to use to look at this offering. What did the offering accomplish then? So we look at the ritual what, did, uh, what aspect of Jesus' work does the offering point to? That's the reality. And what do we learn today? That's our response to it. We get to serve this king, and as we serve him, we reflect him. And you're going to find that as we go through these five offerings in the next few chapters, over the next few weeks, that there, is a, there are at least three reasons uh, why you would present an offering to God like this. One is to make atonement, um, I think that word in English was first used in the Tyndale translation of the Bible. It's a coined uh, term in English, at one meant. Uh, it's the making of you at one with God. So this sacrifice can have a purpose, the offerings we see, uh, to bring us to God, to start our relationship with God, providing forgiveness, but also as a gift. There are some sacrifices, and you can look at the tribute offering, also known as the grain offering in chapter 2, um, or the fellowship offering, where there's a gift that you present to your king as his subject or also of fellowship, where not only the priest eats, but you also eat. And it's like having a banquet before your king with him there eating with you. 
And because our God is relational, he says, are you a sinner? Are you broken? This offering. Have you committed a specific sin? Intentional? This offering. Was it unintentional? This offering. Do you want to just thank me for how much I have blessed you and protected you? This offering. This is a God that's relational. So when you read Leviticus in your, on your own, have that in your mind. God loves me. God wants me to be with him. He wants me to know him. And he will go to great lengths to provide a way. And as he does that, the surrounding nations can see that this is the place where you meet him. So just a quick um, warning that in a few seconds, we're going to go back to the tabernacle. So camera people, just giving you a warning on that. Because that tent is the tent of meeting that God speaks from. And the whole burnt offering, also known as the rising up offering, because it's the aroma rising up into God's nostrils, a metaphor in the Old Testament for God accepts it. Who's allowed to perform it? The priests. The when? It depends on the offering. But the burnt offering, for example, morning and evening, it is offered. What exactly happened? Well, you had your options, didn't you? Had your bull. Okay. Have a look at him there. Kids have already found this bull. Um, I have, uh, I had planned to uh, sacrifice him, but uh, I didn't come up with a, with a I was going to put, uh, actually, I won't tell you, because when we get, we're going to do the, the grain offering next week, so for those of you who are bloodthirsty, no blood for you. Um, but afterwards, we're going to get to the fellowship offering, and then to the sin offering, and to the reparation offering, and then we're going to come back. Um, but a bull, or a sheep, or a bird, why is that? Okay? As we go through the steps, we're going to make sense. So here's what you do. You're convicted of your sin, of your sinfulness before God, that you don't deserve to be in his presence, but he's made a way, and you want to dedicate totally yourself to him. If you have good financial uh, means, you go for the most expensive, the bull, a young bull. Not so much, sheep or goat. Not so much, remember Jesus' parents at the temple? Turtle dove. You bring a bird, okay? Everyone has access to a relationship with God, and even if they are poor, they are welcomed to receive God's forgiveness. Whatever your situation, however, it's going to cost you. It's costly. You cannot simply catch an animal in the wild. It has to be an animal you have reared from your flock, from your herd. It has to be valuable to you. Remember, David said this in the books of Samuel. If it doesn't cost me anything, I cannot give it to the Lord. And so in this step, as you bring to the um, tabernacle, you're bringing the best. As you glance over the verses, it's without defect. There's nothing wrong with your animal. It's a valuable animal. You get your stuff from this. You get milk, you get wool, you get your meat. Okay, This is really costly to you. One in our congregation uh, is very practiced at slaughter. And uh, he's not here this evening, but I, uh, I called him. We're going to interview him uh, in, in a week to come. But I said, so, I said, John, you slaughtered animals before. Oh, yes, deer season, deer culling season, daily, okay? And I said, just tell me here, you're experienced with this, how much would it cost today in this good economy for us, for, for uh, perhaps a supermarket, to buy a bull from a farmer do you know what he said? And a supermarket's going to be a ripoff, right, on the farmer. So pay the lowest possible price. A thousand pounds. A thousand pounds. Imagine, you become aware of your sinfulness before God, and you know that if you want to offer him for the atonement on your behalf, you put your hand on the head of a bull, costs a thousand pounds. Have you got a thousand pounds to spare? If you do, come see me after the service. Only the best. Don't bring manky old worthless sheep, birds, bull, nobody wants. Don't just bring to the church the manky old sofa that you don't want anymore. Don't just bring to God's people your very worst. The last and the worst of your energy, of your time, of your ability to serve God. The most grumpy you. That's really interesting, isn't it? Already we begin to see 
Because you can only serve God because of Jesus. We're going to get to that. But I'm already telling you, if here we see that God only wants the best, even now, those of us who belong to Jesus, can we give him any less? Will he accept it? Malachi says no. Because Malachi reads, we're going to get to it. I'll, I'll start reading it to you. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due to me? If I am a master, where is the respect due to me, says the Lord God Almighty. It is you priests who show contempt for my name. I think I may have forgotten to put it on there. And he says, how have we shown contempt for your name, they say to God. And he says, by offering defiled food on my altar. What are they? Blind animals, lame or diseased animals. Try offering them to your governor, they say. If we, can we be in a place where we offer the best of our mind, of our time, to our school, to our work? than we do to God? We can be in a place like that, can't we? And I felt really convicted because at the end of that passage in verse 9 in Malachi, now plead with God to be gracious to you with such offerings from your hands. Will he accept you? No. And it convicts me that I want to be dedicated. And the weird thing is this. I find that working for a church, more so than church members, if someone just says, you know, I told you the other week that my previous boss, um, mercifully, and he's very merciful, he doesn't do this to me, um, but my previous boss would just come up to me and say, you ready for the sermon? You know, and just kind of, and I'd just be really, really nervous. Um, it wasn't, I wasn't preaching that day, but he just wanted to <laughs> make me suffer a little bit, put me on my toes. And I just think, can I be so mechanical? And I can be, it's a danger for me and a danger for you, that I show up to church I'm ready to do any job because I've just got the pre-prepared formula. Imagine if you are a priest. I mean, a priest is really a butcher. The animal comes in. He'll help separate everything. As you'll notice in the burnt offering, you, the worshiper, you actually slaughter the animal. Talk about seeing the cost of your sin. You are slaughtering the animal yourself. And the priest is doing everything mechanically. Okay, it goes on the altar. Take the ashes out. Okay, fine, start again. You can become very complacent, can't you? Those of us here this evening who belong to Walton Church, you know exactly where you sit every week. <laughs> okay, you know exactly what's going to happen after the service. You know the format, the liturgy, and it can just become blasé, can't it? But here, do you know how much of the bull you keep? Nothing. Total dedication is what the Lord desires. Total dedication from us. And so it makes me want to ask, is our faith, the cost of our faith, appropriate to the means that we have? Am I someone who could afford the young bull in terms of time, effort, energy? And I'm just coming in with a pigeon, you know, just coming in with a circle dove. Let's not offer God the last and the worst of our time. But anyway, we better speed up because this is just bringing the offering to the tabernacle. Uh, number two, you lay a hand on the head the tr what has been variously interpreted as the transference of guilt, my guilt, my ownership of this animal, this now belongs to God. As this animal is going to die, I don't die. If I'm guilty of sin and of treason against the king and I don't kill the animal, I die. So atonement, this is symbolism of that transference of guilt. They die so you won't have to. And then thirdly, the animal is inspected. It's accepted and then slaughtered so that, verse 3, it will be acceptable, which is a sign of the Lord's pleasure and favor. I accept this. You are forgiven. Blood is collected after you've done the slaughtering. It's brought to the altar. It's splashed. Blood that cleanses. We talk about how in Leviticus 17, uh, blood uh, is symbolic of life. That life that was killed instead of yours. Number four, the animal is then completely burned. Unlike other offerings that are shared by the priests, you don't get to eat this. And already we have at least six massive things that we've learned from the burnt offering. Let's look at them for a second. Number one, God wants relationship. He is the one actually calling Moses from the tent and saying, I want you to come to me. Let me tell you how. Number two, everyone needs atonement. You're going to notice, particularly when we get to uh, the sin offering, even the priest cannot atone for himself. He needs another priest to come and atone for him. 
Everyone needs atonement. And yet, number three, atonement is for everyone. Anyone can come to God, even the poorest of the poor, so long as they come in the way that God requires. Atonement is costly. Think about it. For some of you, it's a very familiar scenario that if you're trying to prepare to come to church, for example, I mean, the church is not the tabernacle and so on, you know, you get that, but you may have had a massive fight with your spouse, with a friend, with your kids in the car, and as you're driving to church and as you're walking into church, all that time, you are meditating on your sin. Because you know that even if you were right in the argument that you have, in the argument that you presented against the other person, maybe your anger was way over or something like that. All the way, guys, you're traveling to um, the place where by the time you get to the temple, you're traveling to Jerusalem. All of that journey, you're thinking, I have sinned. I'm coming here to pay for my sin. I'm coming here to offer it to God in faith. can't be mechanical. If it's not mingled with faith, it's not accepted. And so it's very, very costly, financially, socially, psychologically, as you meditate on your sin. I've already told you that number five, it requires total dedication and how that applies to us today. And lastly, the Stephen Fry's of this world don't like this one. We've all known people who would say things like, you know what, I will believe in God if, fill in the blank with, God needs to come to me my way. If he does miracles, if he appears in a vision, a dream, if he heals my nana, or whatever, we misunderstand that the big image that we see in the tabernacle here, in the book of Leviticus, is God is God. We are his creation. When we come to him, we must come to him his way. What a lesson, especially when we read something in the scriptures that our culture, as Andy mentioned this morning, our culture doesn't like. But we come to him his way. We are wholly his. But it would be a mistake to stop there. In the very little time uh, that we have, here's the reality that it points to, okay? Jesus is the lamb without blemish. Write furiously down, because it's seven o'clock, so write furiously down so that you can read everything uh, later on. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, how is Jesus described? You were not, um, for you know that it was not with perishable things as silver or gold, or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish blemish. Think about the cost. Think about Leviticus. We lay our hand and transfer our guilt on Jesus by believing in him. He gave his one and only son. John chapter 3 verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever doesn't believe, if the animal doesn't die, what happens to you? You die. If you don't lay your hand on Jesus by trusting in him, what happens? You stand condemned. Jesus was inspected and accepted. Hebrews chapter 7, you remember uh, that in verses 26 and on, Jesus is described as holy blameless, pure, set apart, he sacrificed for their sins once. Number four, Jesus was completely offered, burnt up, Ephesians 5, 2. Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. All of Jesus' life was a pleasing aroma to God. Here are some questions for you based on that, based on Jesus being our whole burnt offering. How much does your Christianity... Ooh, skipped all of that, didn't I? How much does your Christianity cost you? Is the king worth everything? One of the saddest conversations I had with a teenager in the past were that they were trying to explain to me that all they didn't want was to be a weird Christian that people look down on. You know? And I, I don't think he just meant um, just make sure that I don't dress in a certain way um, I think what he meant as he explained it in the conversation was, I don't want for that to be anything in me that other people look at and they go. But as Andy said, can you be a disciple or even make disciples without upsetting other people? No. It will cost you friendships. It will cost you money. It will cost you time, effort. What would represent your whole burnt offering that God expects perhaps an area in your life right now that he wants all of it and you are not happy to do it. Think about one tiny little example of something that we can hold back. I'm a part of this church. I'm married. Please have nothing to do with my marriage. 
please don't ask me any questions about my marriage. It cannot belong to God in the counseling of his people. Strong, isn't it? Please don't ask me how I'm doing with the battle against porn. Please don't. Even if you are a deep, trusted, close friend, don't. I'm holding back. I'm not willing for God to come and poke at every area of my life. I want to keep some. I don't want to, I'm not willing to see it go up in smoke because that would have been a thousand quid going up in smoke. I don't want to spend the effort in maintaining a difficult relationship or placing limitations on my standard of living because I want to keep some of that bull, sheep, goat back. There are many other applications that we could go through, but we don't have time. And so as I pray now, and as we cancel the last song um, and finish our time together, think about this. I know that it's hard to be challenged. I've been so challenged this week, but I've also been so, made so joyful. Because as I look at the king among his people, I see he loves me. He wants to be in a relationship with me. He wants to provide forgiveness daily so that I am assured I have a hope with him forever. And as I look at the ritual, the reality of it pointing to Jesus, I respond with just the words, take, teach me what it means to be wholly dedicated to you, following in the footsteps of the Christ who rescued me. Let's pray together.